the new channel. The new channel. Hashtag TNC now. The views, opinions, and insights expressed in the following shows are those of the host, producers, guests, and viewers. They do not necessarily reflect the position of the channel. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the new channel. Our passion transforms a community that sees all things new. I'm Alpha Sanford and I'm streaming live from Boston, Massachusetts. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, mabuhai. Welcome to Once a Teacher, Always a Teacher on the new channel. Alpha Sanford on this beautiful Saturday morning. Can you believe it? It's uh, here in Massachusetts. It's the third week of being in school, and I am excited to see all of you this morning. So this topic that we're having today is very, very important. For those of you who don't really know yet about microaggression, this is your chance to really know what is it all about. You probably have heard about it, you've read about it, but what is it truly about? So today I am um, bringing you a wonderful guest who is an expert on this topic. Let me give you a little bit background in terms of our guest speaker for today. Um, our guest speaker, Ms. India Barrows, is the SEAM Education Collaborative Coordinator of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Ms. India Barrows holds a Master of Education degree with a concentration in higher education from Merrimack College and has worked since 2017 as both the Assistant Director and Director of Diversity and Inclusion at New England College. In this role, she has served as a consultant to staff, faculty, and students through creating programming and training opportunities that support broadening diversity and inclusion. So without further ado, let us bring in Miss India Barrows. India? Hello. Hi, India. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for uh, agreeing to be with us because I know that a lot of our viewers have been wanting to learn and clarify what is microaggressions. 
Yeah, so thank you for that. So tell us, how have you been since the start of this school year? I've been good. It's been really busy. Um, this is my first real first day of school and the whole um, training over the summer because last year I started in September. So after the first day of school. So I think that was really great to get to see the full experience <laughs> this time around. So yeah, but I've been busy in a good way. Yeah, I bet you've been busy, especially when it comes to training on diversity, yes. equity, and inclusion. We need folks like you. So thank you <laughs> for the work that you do. Thank All you. right. So our topic for today is really about microaggressions. But before we go into the full theme of things, let's start first with how do you define the word microaggression? So a part of my role is a lot of work focused on racial equity. Um, so sometimes the language I'll use today will be really race centered, but I also want to uplift that there's intersections in identity um, around gender and sexuality. So if I say that sometimes swap things out. Um, but my definition of microaggressions are brief and everyday slights, insults, indignities um, that are sent by people. I don't always say well-intentioned because some people are not always well-intentioned, but some people will define it as well-intentioned people, um, but they're unaware of the hidden messages that they're communicating to people. Um, so an example is saying like, oh, you're so articulate to a black person. There's lots of implications to that or an unspoken assumption that a black person wouldn't be articulate. Um, so that's how I define it. Wonderful. Can I just clarify in terms of what you had mentioned? Mm -hmm. uh, the word articulate. So for people like myself, um, I've heard it many, many times. In a recent conversation with another person of color, this uh, person of color had mentioned to me, but Alpha, shouldn't I take that as a compliment when somebody tells me that I'm articulate? So what do you think in terms of that situation? I think oftentimes with microaggressions, because they can be often so subtle, um, it's a personal feeling um, that someone can come to that conclusion of like, oh, that did offend me or that made me feel some type of way. And I also know in my own experience, as I've grown and matured and learned more about the world and more about these concepts, things that I thought were acceptable 10 years ago, I've now learned like, oh my God, maybe that was a little coded. Um, that was, there's a little bit of coded language in there um, that I didn't get at the time, especially when working with young people. A lot of times I have teachers share with me of like, I don't understand why this student is not offended by what other, the other students said. And it was like, it's not for you to determine <laughs> whether it's offensive to that person, but one day they'll realize that it was offensive. So what can we do now? So that behavior doesn't even happen in the first place. Um, but it's definitely personal because there are things that people share with me that I don't realize our microaggressions all the time because we're all learning and growing. Um, and that just broadens my understanding. That's right. That's right. Can you give us more examples of everyday microaggressions? Like concrete examples or like break them down? Because we can just um, <laughs> you can do you can share whatever you have in your mind, India. I think it's so broad, right? Yeah. But whatever is coming to you right now that you think may be helpful to our viewers. Sure. Um, there are like micro assaults and these are intentional. So this is that overt racism, that KKK throwing a brick through a window because it's an assault, right? Um, which I don't think is hard for us to always see. But then there's micro insults that are possibly unintentional acts of racism or sexism or homophobia or transphobia that deliver a hidden message. So that articulate, that, oh, you're so pretty for a dark skinned girl. Or like, oh, I'm so, wow, I'm, you're so pretty for a fat girl. Like, oh, because if she's fat or if she's dark skinned, there's no way that she can also be pretty. Um, I also consider that 
code, um, like policing language and tone. Um, mm -hmm. Because a lot of cultures have, well, every culture has a different norm for how they communicate and what's considered insulting and what's not. Um, and just because it's more comfortable for the dominant group, which in our society in American society is white people, just because it's more comfortable for white people to receive and give feedback in a certain way doesn't make it the right way. And trying to police people into communicating in the way that maintains their comfort can be incredibly harmful over time. And then there's micro invalidations that um, diminish lived realities of people of color and other marginalized identities. So when someone is sharing with you their experience, maybe even personally my experience with you or my experience with this system or this, or I don't like going to that store because I always get followed and mm -hmm. that person receives and it says, oh, that's not true, I never get followed. Yeah, girl, because you're white. <laughs> Or, that's you know, right. Like, <laughs> and that's okay too, because that's their lived experience, but don't invalidate someone else's in the process. That's right. Uh, um, I just wanted to share with you uh, something that happened to me about uh, three years ago or so uh, in the same lines as being followed. Uh, one day, right, I was uh, um, at a bank and it was a, a very cold winter day and there's a foyer and uh, a person was already inside uh, the ATM back machine. And it's a very, very cold day. And in my experience, as long as you keep uh, a distance, at least six feet away from the ATM and you, and you don't really see what's going on in front or on the screen on the ATM, then you're fine, right? So this person was like, uh, excuse me, why are you here? And I'm like, I'm here because, you know, I'm supposed to take money from the ATM machine. And so the conversation went on to the extent that the other person who is white was like, I'm really feeling uncomfortable right now. And I was like, why are you feeling uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Is it because, you know, I'm a person of color and a person who doesn't really look like you? Mm -hmm. And she just kept on saying, could you please, could you please? And I kept on saying, it's very cold outside. And typically, you know, this is where I usually stand. I wait inside the foyer for my turn. I'm not doing anything. But you could see, or at least I could see at the moment, that the other person was really uncomfortable Mm -hmm. with having somebody, probably someone that she has not quite seen in a while in the community. Um, and yeah, she's feeling the fear and the comfort of being around somebody of color in the bank. And that's why oftentimes when I do trainings, of a, when people ask me, hey, can we do a training on microaggressions? I often partner it with implicit bias. Uh -huh. Because if folks are not unlearning or recognizing that instantaneous reaction that they have when they see someone, they don't even realize that there's a neurological thing going on when they see someone that's different than them. How could they possibly recognize if and when they're committing microaggressions, right? So I, I don't think they could be separated um, as I've like grown in my practice and talking about these things of like, no, they need to be together because off they'll might say like, oh, like I didn't mean anything by it. Like you were just a stranger that walked in and it was like, but would you have reacted like that if it was someone of the same identity group as you? Mm -hmm. And the bad thing is not your first thought because thoughts are internal and we can't necessarily control them. The bad thing is the action that followed. <laughs> the harm was the action that followed. So if you're not figuring out that bias that you have inside, you're not going to realize when, when you're doing microaggressions. That's right. Um, I love how you pointed out that implicit bias and microaggressions really go hand in hand. Um, would you say that uh, uh, the implicit bias 
comes first and then the microaggression because of the subtlety of it like comes up naturally sometimes as a joke yeah because i think implicit bias can be the inside thought microaggressions is the action that follows mm -hmm. um so it doesn't just come out of nowhere mm -hmm. <laughs> in my opinion yeah so for our um viewers who are um non-bipoc also our white viewers um what could be the things that they need to be more aware of in terms of um their own implicit bias or you know in general um about microaggressions i think people should have a one of my superintendents calls this a curious mind. Yeah, um, I love it. That's why I was like, let me cite my source. Um, and I think always asking yourself, why did I react this way? Why did I feel this way? And even doing some swapping out of identity groups of like, if this was a young Hispanic boy, would I have done this? Also consider skin tone. I think white people especially don't always consider skin tone either. Um, I know we do as people of color, <laughs> but um, I think that also impacts their perception of the world too. Um, and I think really thinking about how your actions impact other people. Mm -hmm. So I think most educators especially are empathetic people. They're in human services and want to help young people and be good people. And consider what does it feel like to be constantly treated this way or receiving these micro invalidations, microaggressions, right? Um, and really dig into that empathy. So when it gets hard for you, like, oh, I'm so tired of talking about this or doing it. But like, no, but the children and people of color in your circle and community are constantly, without choice, having to navigate spaces that they're getting picking and choosing if and when they're gonna respond <laughs> um, to these microaggressions. So really committing to, you know, I don't want anyone that walks in my circle or in my life having to do that around me. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do? That's right, that's right. India, um, I'm just thinking right now, um, some of the questions that uh, has come up to me are questions such as, where'd you go? <laughs> Where you come from, right? Um, what do you think of that phrase? <laughs> I think it, it's a microaggression. <laughs> Tell it, say it loud, please. <laughs> microaggression, especially depending on who it's coming from. Okay. If you have an established relationship. Um, if I'm in line at the grocery store <laughs> and you see me and you like my hair, which happens to me quite often, this is not my real hair, this is my fancy hair, guys. Um, but like you know, your hair is like big and curly. Um, yeah. they're like, Oh, I love your hair. Where are you? Where are you from? And I'm like, That's weird. You just say mm. you love my hair, like, <laughs> like you wouldn't have asked that of anyone of a non black person mm -hmm. who likes their blowout, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you just ask that. Um, mm -hmm. and you have to also consider how this happens every single time someone mm -hmm. leaves the house. <laughs> right, right. And it is not people's. It is not someone's responsibility to be teaching you all the time. Um, right. Good question. <laughs> yeah. So, what could uh, people who may not be aware of this simple microaggression do, so that they will not commit saying these questions or doing these things? that may subtly hurt the feelings of other people? What would they do? What should they do? I think first they should tap into themselves and figure out when, has there ever been a time that I felt that this has happened to me? I say that is with women especially, because there's women in every group. <laughs> um, and asking women like, has there been a time that you feel that your gender was, the implied in whatever response or conversation you were having and getting tapped into if and when that has happened to you, 
helps you be like, oh, so that's what that was. And now you can see it more either in your own life or in people around you. And then that I think it also needs to be partnered with relationship building. If you don't know anyone that doesn't look like you, if you don't hang out with people that don't look like you or believe in different religions than you, right? I'm not talking like drastic moral differences, but like people who are a little bit different than you, um, you're just gonna continue perpetuating these things. Mm -hmm. And I always say in the trainings, my goal for my participants is that I hope that you have someone who doesn't look like you that is such a good friend that they can open your refrigerator when they come to your house. Because that's a different level of intimacy <laughs> and comfort and type of relationship. Not everybody can just open your fridge. <laughs> right. So that's the type of relationships you have to build. And when you have relationships with people who are different than you, they will feel comfortable to share like, ooh, don't say things like that. Like, we don't say that anymore. Like, that was really offensive. Like, you're going to get canceled or <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so it needs to be introspection and relationships partnered with that education piece on YouTube and all these things and watching trainings and going to trainings. You can't PD your way out of it. It needs to be a part of your life. So introspection, relationship building, and education. I got to coin that. Look at me. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Education, in, introspection, and is it training? Education, introspection, and relationship building. Relationship building, yeah. I love that actually. And the fact that you're down. <laughs> you gotta have to write it down. Yeah, I, I, I true, I, I, I love it so much, especially when you said about you know the analogy of having somebody open, uh, being able to open up your refrigerator at home. So if you don't really quite have that relationship with that person, maybe, you know, we get to have to step back and be more sensitive when it comes to our uh, choice of words, when we are in choice of actions, when we are interacting with people who may not be familiar or as familiar um, as with some of other other friends right yeah all right india i'm curious was it the, was there ever a moment in your dei life when you realized how microaggressions have affected you yes um okay. when i first started my career um like my like research and my passion is in race right I, you could ask my mom, my first report card, my first report was on Harriet Tubman in like second grade. I handed it in three weeks early. Like I was so, this is all I've ever cared about my whole life. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it wasn't until I started my career that I realized that my gender mm -hmm. played a role in how I'm perceived. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, what the hell? Like, I, I know they're not. I know he, this person isn't like racist or anything. So I know it's, I was like, is it because I'm a woman? And it was like <laughs> this crazy aha moment. And I was like, wow, like this is nuts. <laughs> and I have, I've never had to figure, well, consciously had to navigate this space. <laughs> and that was really, really hard in my first couple years of my career. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually my gender more than my race. Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah. What was there any phrases uh, that uh, are sticking to you right now that our viewers could learn from? I think the biggest one for me is being interrupted mm. in a meeting, mm -hmm. spoken over, and then when you make room for yourself, because I can be quite assertive, um, then they like take your ideas yeah. and like rephrase what you just said twenty minutes ago. And then everyone else in the room, except the women, <laughs> most of the women are looking around like, oh, great job, great job. And I'm like, I said that 20 minutes ago and I had to scream from the mountaintops to even be heard. <laughs> um, and what I want also is a little bit of allyship in those times too, for if you see someone experiencing those, mm. check in with that person. Mm. Like, oh, do you want me to say something? Cause I'll tell them to stop interrupting. Mm -hmm. like, there's a, Obviously there's the line to tell between like 
speaking for somebody. And like you said, what if they don't realize that this should be offensive or whatever, right? But check in with that person of like, girl, I saw that he was talking over you. You want me to say something next time or speak up? I think also on the other side of this is speaking up when you notice somebody else <laughs> is yeah. doing a microaggression. <clears throat> I love those. I really love those, India. Which brings me to the term mansplaining. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us your thoughts <laughs> regarding mansplaining. I just, I always, I really was like, oh, that doesn't happen to me. Like until it happened to me. <laughs> um, and it really, it grinds my gears. And it's um, a man explaining, a man, male presenting person too. A man explaining um, something that I already know or you would already know. So it's almost like a man explaining childbirth to a woman or a person with a with a reproductive system. And it's like, sir, my mom has been telling me since I first menstruated. Like, <laughs> I know. I've, I've been in this body for a long time. Like, <laughs> I know. It's explaining things that I would already know. Or in like professional spaces mm -hmm. where we might even be on the same tier of the profession so we are at the same level of expertise and you're explaining to me something that I would already have to know to be able to do this job. <laughs> you're still explaining it to me. <laughs> right. Um, so check yourself. <laughs> yeah. Ask, oh, do you know about blah, blah, blah? And then you're like, and the person will say, oh yeah, I know. Okay, great. And we move on. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you, India. So in all your years as a, a leading DEI leader, how, is, how important it is to talk about microaggressions in public schools, particularly teachers in relationship to teaching students or mm -hmm. teachers interacting on a daily basis with students? I think it's so important because of how much time you spend with young people um, for their first, from like five to eight, four or five to 18, 17, 18, they spend the most amount of their time with you <laughs> than anyone mm -hmm. besides their classmates, right? And oh my. I think we just lost uh, Miss India Barrows. So why don't we just take a quick break for now? And uh, when we are back, we'll bring her back in. All right, we'll see you in a bit.
Juan Lu and his puppets face to face with special guests Makata Tawanan, Jess Box, and the Lunaria Marionette Show. Salita. Alam mo tito na ano kung malala ako, magsasalita ka ng isa. <laughs> <laughs> November 13, Sunday, 7 p.m. at the La Verdad Auditorium in Apalit, Pampanga. Buy your tickets now and see you soon, face to face. We're back. Thank you for um, still being with us. So why don't we bring back in Miss India Barrows? India? Hello. There you go. Hi. Hi. So uh, we were talking about uh, microaggressions in the public schools. That's where we left off and how important it is to talk about microaggressions <laughs> in the public schools. Yes. So like I was saying, I think it's, we, our students spend so much time with us um, for such a huge amount of time in their development. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, we want to make sure it's a space that they can be their full authentic selves and be present. We talk about mindfulness all the time nowadays. And that also pertains to young people. And they need to be able to be present in this space. And that requires them to be in a safe space that they're not constantly navigating and um, editing themselves in order to belong in this environment. And at the end of the day, we want our students to learn. And if our mm -hmm. students are distracted, whether it be from hunger, if there's food insecurity, I think of it as the same as a racially safe space or a place where they can be as safe to be themselves, where they're not distracted and they can just learn their fractions. <laughs> um, and that's on the adults. And I often say in my trainings too, that I know when I was a young person in school, there were things that I allowed to mm -hmm. happen to me that I didn't realize were harmful until my brain was done developing. <laughs> I, so I say, you don't want to be the reason they're in therapy. You don't want to be the topic that they're talking about in therapy 10 years after graduation. So you might not see the harm right now. You might not see how it's impacting them now because they're also navigating their own social hierarchies and systems mm -hmm. as young people. But there's, it's like the stock market. You put it in and in the 10 years you get a return. So we don't want that for our kids and we want them to learn. And as much safety and psychological and physical safety you can create for them, then they'll learn. Mm. I love it, India. And it just struck me to my core in terms of what you're, you said, you don't want to be the topic during therapy sessions or whatever counseling sessions or any other sessions that they may have with uh, people processing like trauma, processing uh, some negative things that happen to their lives. 
And as I was listening to you, I'm like, yep. <laughs> a lot of the things that I talked with uh, a few of my coaches has something to do with the experiences that are actually under the category of microaggressions, such as, you know, the way that uh, uh, my words come out uh, and how people have commented in terms of, oh, can you please talk faster? Oh, Alpha, can you please talk slower? Oh, what? Can you say that again? Like squinting their eyes, you know? And for someone whose English is not their native language, that somehow, you know, gets into me sometimes yeah and uh, yeah because then over time you start to believe it almost even yeah. if you don't really believe it um your body starts to believe it um i even think of that especially with like body mm -hmm. as in young women and girls of like every woman i know would be like oh I, if only i liked my body 10 years ago we waste so much time because the world tells us that we're this, that, and the third. <laughs> um, but do you believe that? Yeah. Um, and that's really hard to do. Right. And if you are a teacher in front of your students and you are uh, unaware that you are saying these words, mm -hmm. again, what I love what, what you said, you don't want to be the teacher or the person that's going to be talked about in a therapy session later on. Ooh, yep. that's not going to be good, right? Yeah, you're supposed to be the one inspiring and motivating, motivating students, young people, right? Yeah. So, um, India, will you walk us through how to recognize, hmm, that's microaggressions, and what to do when you are confronted with microaggressions? In order to recognize microaggressions, it just takes practice uh -huh. and experiencing different experiences than your own. So I always tell people, listen to different types of podcasts than you normally listen to, because people of color are being very honest <laughs> on social media and in podcasts and YouTube and all these other platforms. I say diversify the content that you're consuming. Watch different shows on TV and the streaming platforms, right? Um, read different books, not just like academic, boring books, but like mm -hmm. read books by different authors and mm -hmm. from different POVs. Um, because as your worldview broadens, you start to see like, oh, I know if I was this fictional character in this book on based in Hindu mythology, like that would be really insulting. So like, mm -hmm. maybe that was harmful. But especially I think for people in the dominant group in anyone's respective society. So in American society, that's white people. When they start to build that recognition, we need to also toe that line of allyship, like I said earlier. So check in with the person that you think was harmed or targeted by the microaggression before you just speak up for them to a certain extent, obviously. If there's super overt harm, you need to speak up for somebody and make sure that they're not being harmed, right? But check in with them and also tap into your humanity and look at that child's face. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking for our little ones, our elementary kids who might not always be, they're not at that self-advocacy place just yet, right? But their faces tell it all and they don't lie necessarily. <laughs> yeah. um, and look at their faces and see if their face falls. Mm -hmm. so their behavior changes throughout, especially in elementary where you're with them for the, the whole day pretty much, um, check in and see, okay, it's like in the morning after Pledge of Allegiance, like I saw this treatment, I didn't really like, okay, let me see. And then I go, I see them in the line and they usually sit next to each other and they're not, and he's now withdrawing from mm -hmm. the class. Like, okay, let me check in with him. Hey, what happened? Like, and then do that repair. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, we're really good as a society of raising that awareness now and having conversations, but where's the action? Where's the repair of the harm? Where's the acknowledgement of the harm? And then finding some sort of resolution to educate that young child or the teacher who did it, right? Um, to not do it again. Mm -hmm. 
I love I, it. I, yeah, especially when you mention how the face of the young children like melts, yeah. you know, yeah. something yeah. is wrong. Yeah. yeah. And they're very honest in terms of their emotions and then their emotions are being expressed on their face or sometimes their behaviors. Yep. So educators, I think that's a wonderful tip that we need to really be aware of. Yeah, yeah. And like that, that's a perfect opportunity to not commit a micro invalidation. Mm -hmm. So when that child chooses to share with you, don't just say, oh, well, you know, he didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. No, you still hurt him. Like, so, okay, would you like me to talk to that per to the person who did it? Would you like to, would you like me to come with you to talk with them? Do you want me to do it? nothing? Like, what do you want to get done? Don't just say, oh, he didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. um, we also always talk about intent over impact. Mm -hmm. um, and okay, maybe they didn't mean it, but it still hurt. So like, don't invalidate um, that child's experience. Let's uh, explain further, India, the intent versus impact. Mm -hmm. To our viewers who may not understand those two concepts. Yeah. So intent is obviously your intention. Why I wanted them to feel supported or like, oh, that's your best friend. Like I would never do anything to harm you. But when you said your words, the, the output, what was received by the listener um, was, ooh, I didn't like that. That hurt me. Or mm, no, it's not landing like you think it's landing. Um, so you might really think, oh, like I really wanted you to feel valued or loved or hear what I'm saying. But in the process, um, the message that was received, the impact was not in alignment with your intent. Mm -hmm. People need to be responsible for the impact of their words and actions and, but, and still like their intent as well. But like sometimes they're not in alignment. Um, or they're misunderstood or not said properly. Um, so we have to take account of the impact. That's right. Yeah. Somehow, um, what's coming to me right now uh, is one of the phrases that I read in one of the many books that I, you know, switch back and forth on a weekly basis. <laughs> and in, in one of the books, it said that if it's impactful, then it's true. And it's also uh, sometimes it's hurtful. And if it's hurtful to you, then it means um, it's true to you, right? So um, let's talk about at a national level, India. Why is microaggression an issue? And to your knowledge, what is happening at a national level that it's making a lot of people, not just people in the education field, but the general public, being more aware of the ramifications of microaggressions. I think the stakes are a lot higher um, for mm -hmm. people um, and the threshold <laughs> for racism and homophobia and transphobia is not the same as it was even five years ago <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in our society. And whether you think that's a good or bad thing, that could be a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> but the, as we become a more globalized world, but smaller because of the internet and we can communicate across oceans <laughs> now in seconds, um, we have to be more mindful of all the people that are getting impacted by the things that we do, the legislation that we put in place, um, the people that we elect, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, because we know policy, especially as educators, policy and laws affect us. Yeah. Um, and if there's laws and policies in place that usually were made to exclude certain types of people, <laughs> given the pattern of behavior in the United States, <laughs> um, you have to be mindful. Um, and that's why it matters who you vote for. It matters, and those people that are in office that maybe 20 years ago could say crazy things. Mm -hmm. um, are now considered insulting and now there's ramifications for that that mm -hmm. maybe years ago they would not have had to like run a real campaign or really have to fight for their jobs um because as a society we've evolved and i think for our young people there's a quote that i pulled from somewhere i cannot remember so sorry but we cannot graduate another 
cohort of students who perpetuate racist systems and practices because it's just not sustainable. They'll lose their jobs. They will harm people deeply. And as people of color and those of other marginalized identities have more and more access to bigger platforms and more spaces, um, you're not about to do that if your CEO is black. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't do what you used to do when yeah. black people didn't have access to those spaces. Um, and I just think like it truly harms people and like who wants to harm people? Mm. At the end of the day, a lot of these things harm people. Yes. And that's why they say Black Lives Matter, because if you don't recognize people who don't look like you as actual human beings who deserve human dignity and respect, nothing is going to change. So acknowledging that people who don't look like you are actual humans and deserves all the rights and access that you do. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you, India. Um, how about any curriculum, you know, in the school system? We have a lot of different curriculum, lots of model, program whatsoever, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a model or curriculum uh, to becoming more aware on microaggressions? Mm -hmm. um, this question, <laughs> this question grinds my gear sometimes in my, if it wasn't a day. Um, because yeah. I think especially in the work that I do, it is so human driven. Yes. There is no algorithm. There is no grid. There is not enough charts in the world to quantify the human experience. Mm -hmm. You have to live it. Mm -hmm. and that's what I want people to do, especially with educators who we love a checkbox and a A, B, C, three points in each. It's so complicated and you have to live it. Um, a video I use, if anybody watches The Good Place, I use Good the video place. of explaining um, the timeline in the afterlife. Sorry, my dog is screaming. That's Let okay. We're not stop. Um, <laughs> as long as we can hear you. <laughs> and it's so complicated. There's no entry point. It is so complex and you come back and do it again. And to what I say is to really tap into your human experience. Bruno, mm -hmm. stop. I'm oh. so sorry. Um, now he has a shout out on the internet. Um, <laughs> Hi, Bruno. Um, <laughs> um, I think like you have to live and you have to commit to this in your personal and professional life. That's that introspection piece like I talked about earlier that you're not gonna PD your way out of this. Mm -hmm. You just have to live. Mm -hmm. And you have to look beyond your own lived experience and acknowledge that those around you have their own. Mm -hmm. And maybe that'll inform how you see the world as you grow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, we're not gonna yeah. we're not gonna curriculum our way out of this. Yeah. Uh, it is a living experience and you just have to commit to doing it. Correct. Yeah. We have a term with the SEED program, the Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity, and we use the term, the textbook of our lives. Mm. So we're not going to be using any other textbook. We're not going to be using any set curriculum, but we will use the textbooks of our lives. Mm. And that's what I'm hearing also from you when it comes to microaggression. We have to live it, right? And I love what you said. We cannot PD away, you know, these uh, microaggressions, yeah. these topics around microaggressions. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, so understanding microaggression at the educator's level, how would every educator try to begin to understand any solutions of microaggression to foster more inclusive, more inclusivity in their schools or in their classrooms? How would they begin to understand, I guess, the solutions in order to become more inclusive in their classrooms? I think they need to look at who's in their room. 
right? Okay. And see, okay, who are, who's all in here? And then see how that impacts. What books are we reading? How are we speaking to children? How are we picking on children? That's why there's tons of frameworks on how to manage a classroom, right? Or mm -hmm. even not saying like, come on, boys and girls. Not everyone's mm -hmm. a boy and girl. Um, let's yeah. go, everybody. So yeah. using gender neutral language. That's the easiest one, I think, because like that doesn't require like someone calling you out or in or however you like to say that. Um, using gender neutral language, looking at the pictures on your walls, um, looking at the books that you're reading, the names of characters, the types of people that you're studying in social studies, um, the scientists that you're studying in science. Um, I even say a real world applications at the higher levels, especially figuring out how does this certain topic interact with their real world and then the a neighborhood around them that's not the one that they're in to mm -hmm. broaden the children's worldviews and also your own. Um, mm -hmm. So they're building that empathy development and consciousness of people that are different than them. And being a space where your students feel safe enough to be like, Ooh, don't, oh my God, that was not good, Miss mm -hmm. Selena. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I say that again. I'm like, oh, okay, my bad. Sorry, won't do it again. Creating that feedback loop where they know, oh, if I tell her that that was harmful, she won't do it again. Mm. Right. India, thank you actually for bringing it to our attention regarding um, what still some educators use, like boys and girls. Hey, guys. Yep. You know, so instead of saying those words, folks who are listening, uh, please uh, let's try to be more inclusive and use uh, uh, more gender, uh, gender neutral terms, such as what India said, everybody, hi, everybody, or hi, friends, or instead of, hey, guys, we can use, hey, folks, or the folks, good morning, folks. Mm -hmm. Right. So thank you for pointing that out, because I think educators begin their day addressing everyone in their class. And if there is like a clear separation already, right, like boys, girls, females, males. Right away, there's that subtle uh, yeah. message that there's separation instead of bringing them together as a whole. Yeah. And we never know what's going on internally for people. Mm -hmm. So especially at the lower levels, they got a lot. They're figuring out themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And as few messages as we can send them while they figure out how they identify, the better. So they feel safe <laughs> and like, oh, I can be openly non-binary here because like that's fine here. Um, yeah. Instead of getting, oh, no, I know I have to pick one. If I'm in this space, in this school, I need to pick one. Right. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, as educators, we got to make sure that our schools and our classrooms are not just safe, but we foster the sense of belongingness for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So India, any last word or any inspirational message to educators who are listening or will be listening to this um, topic later on? Amazing. It's so great that you brought up belonging because that's what I would say. Okay. Um, say I, I've in, informally added belonging to my title um, because I think without belonging, what's the point? Yes. What's the point of all this if our people do not feel like they belong in our schools? And I want to extend that to not just our students, but also our staff. Um, if there's no sense of belonging and there's no sense of urgency to address these issues, to remedy these solutions, the cycles of oppression are gonna keep happening. Um, we can talk about it, but you gotta be about it. Um, and that is grounded in belonging. If our goal is every single person that walks through our doors can be their full authentic selves and come home safely, we did it. Oh, that's a beautiful message, India. And uh, um, where can our viewers um, get in? Uh, you know, get in touch with you, especially if they would want to dig more, because you just scratched the surface on microaggressions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just a little scratch on it. 
But if any one of our educators or even education leaders out there would want to talk to you more about it, how can they get in touch with you? Um, they can email me. Uh, maybe I'll get a social media now. This is my first like public appearance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, they can email me at my email. Um, All right. Me... Should I What's type it? Email? I'll type it. Yeah. Um, it'll be. I should give you my professional email. It'll be consulting. Dot barrows at gmail dot com. Okay, consulting.barrow.com. Wonderful. Well, um, India, this has been an awesome day, morning with you talking about microaggressions. I hope that our viewers were able to learn uh, a little bit more on the topic of microaggressions, uh, but I'm sure if they want to dig deeper and go in depth about microaggressions and inclusivity, please make sure to get in touch with India Barrows at consulting.barrows at gmail.com. All right, India. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm very honored that this is your first time to be with us. So I'm leaving this show with such gratitude uh, for India and for allowing us to share her wisdom to all of us. I learned a lot and I hope you did too. All right, everybody. Thanks again for being with me and India. I will see you next week. Bye for now. Oh, 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 oh,